tell the high school teacher, because if she doesn't start things on time, <laughs> and I have that annoying high school teacher's study hall voice that doesn't go away, but we don't have a microphone, so if it's okay, um, before anything else, I just want to do a sound check. Um, am I too loud for you? No. 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 All right. You, I can be heard in the back, and if the annoying high school study teacher voice gets to be too much, move to the back. Anyway, we're um, very, very grateful to Sherry and all of the people who coordinated this convention for giving us space and time to think together about Afghanistan, and to each of you, of course, for coming this morning bright and early, and we wanted to start with introductions. And so um, I'll just say, very briefly about myself, my name is Kathy Kelly. I'm with, I'm with, I'm a co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence, and um, thank you, Dennis. Um, I've had the great good fortune to go back and forth to Afghanistan really many times, uh, maybe 20 by now, and uh, there's nothing like being in a place to make your your learning curve go upward in terms of wanting to pay attention to what's going on. Um, and I also had experience going back and forth to Iraq 27 times to break the economic sanctions against Iraq. Um, the greatest disappointment and failure in my adult life has been that we never lifted those economic sanctions and though some of the suffering might have been alleviated through the many, many collective efforts to both oppose economic sanctions and try to prevent that war, the war went forward. But nevertheless, the world came closer than ever before to stopping a war before it started. And that we must, I think, carry as a mantle as we continue to dedicate ourselves to stopping, to ending, to abolishing the hideous and the abysmally failed wars that go on. So um, I'm, I know that I'm speaking to a group that is a very good choir. And we see this morning as kind of a little bit of tune up. If we can be useful, we'll be grateful and glad for that. I want to say one other thing. Um, Elliot Adams uh, was uh, part of this convention and has been. And I was watching him work out how he was going to handle handouts. And he totally avoided papers. So I want you to know we do have handouts. We would very much like to share with you a, a bibliography of some novels that maybe some of you would like to read with a book club. We'd like to share with you um, a list of the websites that we'll refer to uh, during the course of this. We'd like to share with you an excellent article by Alfred McCoy, 2016, one of the finest researchers with regard to economics and peasant economies and heroin traffic. It's a long article, but it's very, very worth reading. So we'd like to share all of that with you. If you give us your email, and if you think, well, sometimes people can't read my handwriting, give us your phone number and we'll call you to double check, then we'll send all of that material to you. And I am just wanting to say with humble gratitude, thank you, Ann Jones, for coming to this workshop and for teaching us so much. So there's a, a sign-up sheet for the email and phone number being passed around. And uh, that's my time of introduction. I'd like to turn it over to Sabia and Aaron to introduce themselves. Again, hi, good morning. Thank you so much for being here so early. Um, I was also saying we're very grateful to be in conversation with you. And for me, I am 29, so the experiences that you have all had are much more than mine. And so for, for me to be here as an intern and to, to learn from all of you and all of your experiences and the fact that you guys gather together and you, as Kathy Kelly says, catch courage from each other, um, it's good for somebody young to see that because I can also get discouraged to see maybe things aren't changing as fast as I would like. And so I'm glad that you have not given up because we haven't either and I don't want you to think that we have. So thank you and yeah, thank you Kathy Kelly for letting me be a part of this and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I feel like I should stand up. Uh, just because everybody else stood up, uh, but I am like a lot taller. So. Uh, my name is Aaron Hughes. Uh, I'm a member of Iraq Veterans Against the War. I was in the Illinois Army National Guard and 
uh, from 2000 to 2006 and deployed to Iraq from 2000, to Iraq and Kuwait from 2003 through 2004 uh, as a truck driver. Um, one of the very first peace activists I met when I returned home uh, and started going back to school was Kathy Kelly. Uh, she was down at the University of Illinois and I was not even thinking about activism or anything about that. I was just trying to make art, uh, trying to figure out what had just happened. And uh, Kathy was the first person I met that had been to Iraq that I could talk to about that place. Um, so I'm really honored to be here on a panel with her and Sabia, and I just want to really thank Sherry for doing all the work to organize this and all the conference organizers. And I hope that uh, you know I, I don't want to you know present myself as an expert on on really any of these things. I just uh, hope we can be a forum to start a dialogue uh, about possible directions to go and what we can learn from the communities and movements that are on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, the most um, recent New York Times coverage that I read about the war in Afghanistan said that the fighting is raging in the province of Helmand, the area of Lashkarga. The Taliban and other warlords are now controlling uh, at least 70% of the country, according to some United Nations statistics. And much of this traces back to the effect of a country having become a narco state and um, the production of opium affecting sectors of life. Much of that having developed because of the conditions of warfare that have obtained in Afghanistan um, through the past three decades at least. And so the, um, the situation is, is extremely difficult in terms of unemployment, lack of potable water, the um, reality that people can't wean themselves off of producing opium very easily because the, the climate and the land are um, predisposed in a sense for opium production being uh, easier for many people, but also there's so much desperation. The United Nations has said that as many as 1,000 people per day flee from their homes. And sometimes, even just the overflight of a United States aerial surveillance vehicle can be the cause of people saying, we're going to pick up stakes and leave our homes, because they're so afraid that a vehicle might come back and target them for bombing, or that they'd be accused of having fed information to the United States. And these kinds of displacements, of course, disrupt any possibility to grow crops and then when the United States says, well, we're going to eradicate the various centers for opium production, this again can cause displacement, disruption, and the situation in Afghanistan is riddled by tremendous corruption, impoverishment, and we're now looking, we will be looking in October 7th of 2016 at now 15 years of the United States war in Afghanistan. So, um, when we think about what that looks like closer to the home where Sabia and I most recently visited, uh, and it's a group called the Afghan Peace Volunteers, um, my most recent uh, email that I have shared with a few people from the delegations that have gone to Afghanistan, and Sherry has also stayed there, and Sabia and I were most recently there in, um, in May, and, and Aaron was there in December, January, the subject was grief, and Ali's brother, uh, Sultan, has been killed He's, uh, for money, really. He signed up to work with the Afghan security forces, and they've sustained higher casualties than ever before. They've also got perhaps 40% people on the payroll that are ghost fighters that you know, aren't really identifiable, and uh, corrupt commanders pocket the money that's supposed to be paid to these fighters, but Sultan was really a fighter, and he was really killed. And his mother, uh, well, I, I first met her in 2010, and even back then she was very distraught, worrying for her son. In the Hazara demonstration that occurred recently in Kabul, there was a huge suicide bombing. 67 people were killed, among them our young friend Zarguna's classmate and good friend, uh, the 
two professors that were kidnapped from the American University of Afghanistan, uh, one from Australia, one from the United States, haven't, as far as I know, been released. There's not a word of what's happened with them, but four of the young people who are very active with this Border Free Center are students of those professors. And so the, the, the young people can feel the tentacles of war coming closer and closer. And when it comes to families that can pull together enough money to flee, um, that also has had an impact. Our young friend Ibrahim, who was one of the street kids in a street kids program that we'll describe, uh, was part of a family that decided to flee. And um, they were among the refugees that were lost at sea. So I'd like to um, turn it over to Sevilla to talk further about what we've learned kind of being closer at hand visiting the Afghan Peace Volunteers. And we have a, a wealth of photo essays and videos that our friend Hakim has made available. So we'll also use the generous AV equipment to look at that as well. So while we were last there, I have the privilege of going to one of Zerbina's <coughs> classes, one of her journalism classes. And um, the professor was late, and so everyone came in, and we all sat down, and we got into a little bit of a circle, and they started, you know, kind of grilling me about <laughs> about the U.S. and what do they think of us, and how is this happening? And then one of the students said to me, "Why, why don't the mothers of your land go to the government and ask them, please stop?" killing my children, you know? <clears throat> and I thought, I think maybe the, the public might be a bit jaded for that question. You know, I, I don't know how to answer that, and I wish I did. And then another one, Hussein, who is a photojournalist, wanted to show me his pictures, and he was telling me about his twin girls, and. He had this wonderful ring, and he said, I think it's from Africa, what do you think? And I'm from Ethiopia, and I was like, I don't, you know, that, that is also a really large continent, but it's a very beautiful ring, you know? And so when Kathy got that message about Hussein, who was this, the photographer that went to that demonstration, you know, it, it kind of, I lost my breath, you know, because I just thought, it was just a split second that he was just showing me these photos and just being madly in love with his twin girls. And I just thought, I don't, I, I can't get a handle on any of this, you know? And um, <coughs> like Kathy said, in a lot of ways, war is senseless. And I, I, a lot of ways that the Afghan peace volunteers and a lot of us come together, uh, I just wanted to read a quote it says, without community, there is no liberation. Communities must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. And the Afghan peace volunteers, they're inter-ethnic, they're multilingual, multicultural, and they do. They have moments of, of knowing these differences and having these surface up, but they have a way of being present with each other through grief and through celebration and through dance that they work through this. And I, I've learned a lot from them. And I want you to, I just want to emphasize that they're young, you know? Some of the teachers are as young as 13 and they're teaching 35 year olds and they're incredible. So I just wanted you to know that this work, it, it is not futile, it is incredibly important all of your actions that you've done teach me you guys find yourselves all across the world and it teaches them you know and they teach us and let me tell you i've learned a lot so i just want to pull up uh, a photo essay of ibrahim and tell you a little bit more about him so please So Ibrahim is the extreme left from, from what I'm seeing. So you're extreme <laughs> right. And so it goes on to say, today when I heard the blast of another suicide bombing in Kabul, I didn't know what to wish for you. I 
I was irritated, rather, my thoughts scattered in multiple fragments because not only did I need to know that you were safe, it hurt me to think of how the sensational images will traumatize you again. The part I wanted to show you was about Ibrahim's grandmother. Forgive me. So again, there he is on the right for you, on the left for me. And it says, Ibrahim was initially a little shy in class. Gradually, he began to warm up to others and the teachers. He also understood quickly, like all the Afghan kids, the need to end war. And on his palm, he has bas, which means enough. They've had enough. And this was his profile picture for the school register. <coughs> Behind him was a painting of a ship at sea. Little did he know that he was, he was to make a fatal crossing of the Aegean Sea while he and his family tried to reach Greece in seeking asylum, fleeing the lack of work and security in Kabul. So as Kathy said, this does not end well and it usually ends with a lot of tears and a lot of confusion. And his grandmother saying, Dear Ibrahim, such a good boy is gone. Gone. How is it possible? Drowned. So I just I wanted to just share that with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm supposed to be the wandering um, help router, so just want to know if you have everything you need. Oh, thank yes, you too. thank you very much. I'll be back. Full time wandering help router, thank you. Um, we want to make kind of a, a deviation now and turn to something that actually my sisters put me on to. It's from 1970. <laughs> it's from the southwest side where I grew up, and it's a video that shows some clips of working class southwest side Chicago people saying we've had it with the war in Vietnam. They're sick and tired of it, and I want to show it to you. Um, and just being, just trying to stay out of trouble and doing the right thing every day, day in and day out. Well, if there's anything to me, that's a silent majority. It's a community like this. This is the common or ordinary community in the United States right here. This is, this is what uh, the United States is. The people who uh, have their security tied up in their property, have uh, take institutions, hospitals for sure, uh, brain retarded muscular children dystrophy. and uh, muscular dystrophy and everything else. We don't have to, money spent on war is non-returnable. It's just money that's blown up. A $500 bomb is $500 wasted. So I'm just against the war. As, as Hadisa mentioned, um, the way she humbly said, I do these small acts so that the future generations do not have to feel this terror. You know, it's, that's what you are all doing. It says bus, which means enough. Enough of war. Bus. It means enough in Dari. And they've had enough of war. Um, some stories are a little bit harder to recall than others. And I think sometimes um, my own emotional makeup causes me to filter some stories out and not really look at them until it's possible to digest them emotionally and mentally. And so I'd like to tell you one of those stories right now. Um, I, I, I know one family quite well who grew up in the Bamiyan province of Afghanistan. 
and I've known them mainly in Kabul, but I have visited them in their own home in Bamiyan. And there was one day when um, a, a pretty uh, angry clash had developed within the community, and I was kind of surprised by it. And so later at night, one of the young ones said, Kathy, I have to tell you a story from my family. And he said there was one night when these five children of a widow trying to feed her children in Bamiyan uh, after war had displaced them and then they finally managed to get back. The father had been killed by the Taliban. This young widow didn't have enough to feed her children adequately and they didn't have enough to have warm blankets at night. And it's very, very cold in Afghanistan. So one brother woke up and his other brother was sound asleep. And the brother that woke up so cold that, you know, imagine the last time you were maybe waiting for a bus outside and it was so cold you thought your feet would freeze. He snatched the blanket off of his sleeping brother. And the brother who was asleep woke up and realized, if I don't get that blanket back, I could die of hypothermia. And the brothers began to fight over that one blanket. And the other family members awoke in horror as they realized that this fight had gotten so out of control that one brother was ready to suffocate the other brother, refusing to give up the blanket. And finally, the family members separated them. But they all remember that violent night fighting over a blanket. Well, those brothers and these families that we know, who still face, just, they're just this far away from complete destitution, they nevertheless throw themselves every winter into creating as Sevilla has said, an inter-ethnic project in which widows who have said to us, I think I'm losing my mind. I'm afraid I'm going insane. And you ask them, what's the matter? And the refrain is always the same, I can't feed my children. They get a small income, but a livable wage, to stuff coverlets full of heavy wool and make big, heavy blankets 4,000 of which were distributed last winter free of charge to people who had no protection from the harsh winter. It's called the Dubai Project. And we can guarantee you it's inter-ethnic. Um, it, it should be bigger than it is because there's so much need. But every winter for the past four winters, these kids have organized 20 Tajik, 20 Pashtun, 20 Hazara women who can't feed their children to earn an income making these heavy blankets. And then they hire the trucks and they distribute the blankets after they've gone out, these youngsters, as young social workers, to try to figure out who are the neediest people in the area. And that's very difficult social work. But that's the kind of surveillance, if you will, that's needed, um, not the surveillance that's accomplished by drones that fly overhead. So um, one other story from uh, Kabul that touches me deeply. You saw Habib, and you saw him living under the tarp, held up by poles. And he lived there with his grandmother, his mother, and his younger brother. And Habib's job was to go to the marketplace and put down a scale and ask people, do you want to step on that scale and weigh yourself? Because that's not the kind of household thing people would have. And then they give him a little bit of money. And if he goes all day long doing that, he can collect enough money to get by. Well, one thing that's made a huge difference in Habib's life is to become part of the street kid's school. And if he goes to the school, then his family, you saw him lugging the rice and the oil, his family will get from the border free center that the kids have organized a, a ration every month of oil and rice so that they can survive without the income that the child laborer would be earning on the street. And the child then gets enough tutoring in language and math to be able to go to school. It's a brilliant project. And so they now got 100 kids in this street kids school. And the teachers are people like Hadisa. There's a young friend of ours named Abdul Han. And he likes to stay fit and trim and, and, and look fit and trim for the others, I suppose. Anyway, he goes out running early in the morning. And I think that's a terrible idea in Kabul. The weather is, um, you know, when it's winter, just traps, horrible pollution, and, and, and nobody should be out running. But, but Abdul Haigo is running. And he said to me one morning that as he was coming back, he saw 
a woman begging. Well, that's not uncommon. And she was covered in the full burqa. And he heard the voice of the woman begging, and he realized that's Habib's grandmother. He knew that because he's gone and he sat in this miserable tarp hole with the mother and the grandmother. He could have kept running, but he didn't. He stopped and he gave her a greeting and he asked her how she was and how is Habib and how is your daughter. And to me, that's Abdul Hai's lesson. We have to stop, slow down, try to gain literacy in the consequences of our various wars. And so we'd like to turn it over now to Eric Hughes, who has done uh, such, to me, estimable, fine, needed work in helping people in the United States gain literacy, if you will, about the consequences of wars. And he's done it with art and determination and great courage. So Erin, thank you for taking us to the next step. Kathy, thank you for the very generous uh, introduction. Um, speaking of Abduhai, uh, th this is one of his photographs. Uh, he takes pictures of a lot of the street kids that go to the school. And, you know, there's something about this idea of learning despite against all the odds, being up against all the odds, about creating despite being up against all the odds. And I think that for me, you know, we heard these powerful speakers the other night and we talk about living in this Anthropocene. And it's like, here are these youth that are living it and are creating in it despite, are organizing it in despite. And I think a lot of times there's this uh, focus on how to organize here and how we build power here. And we think about all these, like Facebook and all these tools that we're using all the time. And I see the way they're building power there. And I think we have a lot to learn about these relationships that they're building, how deep they're going. You know, that how, how their whole focus is on youth. You know, these young generations, a whole about education. And, uh, you know, the Roy Scranton's kind of push to everyone the other night was, what are the institutions that can last generations when we know that this system we live in, dependent on fossil fuels, is collapsing. And here are these youth that are building those institutions. And I took a lot of inspiration from that. And, you know, my kind of experiences through the art, so I, you know, I saw this awesome photograph that Abduhai took, and I was like, oh, let's turn it into a print so people can spread it around and Another design by a photograph by Abduhai that was then turned into a print or a, a graffiti art by Kabul Knights. We, we then we turned it into a print, um, and we did a printmaking workshop at the Border Free Center for all these youth, and they all like made their own prints, and <laughs> we're figuring out how to tell their stories. And to me, this idea that they can create something when they're surrounded by so much destruction that they can create something that's theirs and that they know that. That they can grow something that's theirs, that they can build a community that's theirs, that is powerful. And I feel like that's what I'm learning from and that's what I want to bring back to all of you. And, you know, I, I just had this reference of Kabul Knights and I'll talk about this in a minute, but you know, he's a street artist that was living in Kabul doing these graffiti projects. And they, at the Border Free Center, before they moved, they had this actual on their center. You know, taking down the drones with love. And you think about what we have. The only response we have as a community is fear. I mean, even our, you know, keynote speakers, there's a lot of fear. And these kids are fearless despite. Fearless despite. And I feel like that's something I want to bring back. And it's, I don't think it's just in Afghanistan. You know, um, I, I hope everyone here, if you haven't, get Ali Issa's book, Against All Odds. This book is extremely important. It documents the movements, the social movements in Iraq 
from 2011 through 2013. And it kind of documents this period of time from the big, from the, the Arab uprisings through the formation of ISIS. And, you know, there's this great, and the introduction, and this is what Vijay Prasad said about the book. Um, would someone mind reading this really loud? Who's got a really loud voice? Who's got the loudest voice? Oh, in the back, she definitely does. <laughs> the path of nonviolent civil disobedience was blocked in 2011 and then sent backward when the Iraqi security forces massacred peaceful protesters in Hawiya in April 2013. Documenting these incidents, Ali Issa's Against All Odds takes us from the 2011 Arab uprising in Iraq when organizers incubated hope for an alternative Iraqi future to emergence of Islamic State in Fallujah and Mosul. Indeed, much of Anbar and parts of Diyala provinces in 2013. Perhaps the natural child of the sanctions and the subsequent U.S. occupation the Islamic State has since done much to destroy any glimpse of hopes. Other histories have been possible for Iraq and indeed might yet be possible. The social basis for the popular movement to save Iraq remains, even if in the shadows. It is the only force that could provide an alternative to the history of blood that stands before Iraq the nest of bones, the sky of death, by like, um, B.J. Prashad in 2014. To me, it's not gone. It's there. And how do we acknowledge it? How do we connect to it? How do we build solidarity with those movements that are on the ground? You know, Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq is still working, helping these internally displaced communities creating safe houses for women that are fleeing ISIS zones, their families. They're still there. They're still doing it, despite. You know, even if it's as simple as making sure that someone has a meal to eat, a safe place to sleep, those are the organizing strategies that they're using, and I feel like there's so much that we have to learn from, because we see it even in our own society, how divisions are growing. And as we enter this phase of depletion, of resource depletion, it's easy for you know, the establishment to perpetuate this place of you know, continued resource fighting between communities and create divisions between communities. And that's what you see. You know, all of this also deals with climate and resources, right? We all know these things. And yet, in the midst of that, there are these communities, and I wanted to, you know, the popular move to save Iraq, the Electrical Utility Workers Union of Iraq, um, investigative journalists, federal workers and councils and unions in Iraq. I mean, these are all groups on the ground, and Ali documents their stories and their struggles in this um, really powerful book. And, and to me, I, I think some of the most important things that come out of it is, you know, Yunar's point, and every single one of the individuals running for president from the, both the conservative, from the Republican and the Democrats, as even Bernie Sanders said the way we were gonna, he was gonna fight ISIS by using bombs. And you know our Organization of Women's Freedom in, in Iraq, this is what she says, you can't force democracy through a gun. And we all know this. And we can't stop ISIS with a bomb. And we all see who are the kids you know, it's, I, I have this mental image, even though I was on the ground in Iraq, I still have this mental image when I think about Iraq and these cities that are getting bombed or Syria that are getting bombed. I always imagine it's kind of like desolate city where no one's living but these like fighters that are hunkered down in maybe a building. But that's not what, that's not what these cities are. I mean, Kabul is eight million people or four million people. It's like half the size of Chicago. I was like, four million people live in Kabul. Four million people. You know, I think the size, the quoted size of ISIS is 
you know, 30,000 fighters or something like that. Millions of people's lives just completely devastated to this place of these small groups and factions. And instead of relying on fear, and uh, instead of relying on hope and love like these youth, we depend on fear and reaction. And so I just want to like continue to try and learn from them. You know, today, you know, this is, uh, um, we're putting more and more troops on the ground in Iraq. Right now there's 4,087 service members in Iraq. And all the reports I've read, you know, from these, from the Army Times, from Defense One, these, all these like military perspectives are about how generals are working on strategies to get a larger presence in Syria and Iraq as a way to truly defeat ISIS. And now we're looking at new strategies around Libya. So this is the direction, right? Here's a, here's a map of you know, where things are at today. This is from the Institute for the Study of War, uh, which is a very conservative, you know, they're, they're uh, in some ways, you know, what the DOD and others rely upon to create their military strategies. But you can kind of see this kind of breakdown of where things are. And this, this small little area here, this is ISIS here. And this is these areas here. These are the controlled areas, and they've been pushed back. But, you know, every time they're pushed back, it also is feeding the seeds. You know, as we destroy ISIS through this violence, the question is, are we establishing, making sure that people have water, people have jobs? Those are the things I was hearing from folks both in, both the demands in Iraq from these movements, but also from the youth in Afghanistan. And in response, you see all these, I know you can't really see it because it's like totally broken down, but you guys should, if you need more information about, you know, the Pentagon's analysis about what's really going on on the ground, this is, this is a great resource. Um, all of these little um, figures here with the with little black squares next to them, those are supposed to be protest signs. These are protests that are happening throughout the area. The military is tracking protests. Against who? Well, there, it's, there's like multiple sides of the whole situation. I don't think I have the capacity to like deconstruct the entire, um, like, I, I can't say like any of these are like for this group or that group. The, their breakdown like divides, like each city has a different dynamic, you know, different groups, different, so I guess I just kind of like bring all that up to think about like what are ways that um, we can learn from these folks that are up against all odds. And I brought these prints that I did based off of, uh, I want to pass them out, and off of Abduhai's photograph. And um, you know, it, what it says here is Mansoor wrote this out for me. I, I copied his, his text who is another Afghan peace volunteer, and it says, we are the street kids of Kabul. We are survivors. That's what it says, we are survivors here. And I just, I kind of want to lift up that like mode of surviving as we think about moving forward. And I bring that up in the sense of, I think about how Grace Lee Boggs responded to the divestment and destruction of Detroit. You know, she didn't say that, oh, industry's coming back to Detroit. She didn't say what the politicians, we always say, they're gonna rebuild Detroit. No, she said, it's not coming back. And we have to build with what we have here. We have to build institutions that can survive. And so for me, I wanna like pull from that, like how do we build institutions that can survive? How do we build survival projects? How do we build educational projects that can last for generations? Just like they're doing in Kabul. Kind of to conclude my whole kind of talk or frame is the direction I see Iraq veterans against the war going is 
you know, there's this side of needing to build up these survival projects, but there's also this side of we need an anti-war movement here in the United States. We need a demilitarized movement here in the United States that's flourishing and growing. 70% of the population in this country, as, as Kathy was pointing out with that video, you know, people are sick and tired of war. And yet we just approved more bombing unilaterally. And so the question is, like, who benefits? And for IBAW, our big analysis after, you know, putting our, putting our lives on the line in a lot of ways to, like, in the Iraq war, and then see that we're not even close to ending it. We're not even close. The global war on terror is, that was my first, I was never originally given the, you know, Iraqi freedom medal, which is like came, came later. It didn't exist when I deployed. There's this interesting amnesia. First came the global war on terror. And Iraq was originally incorporated into this global war on terror. And that global war on terror is like, it is now even deeper entrenched than it ever has been. And I'm telling you, you cannot win a war on terror. It doesn't work. You can't fight terror with more terror. And so the question is, how do we build something that can transform the system we're in? How do we push back while we're preparing to build these institutions that can survive? And for IVAW, we're looking at the drop the mic, drop the military industrial complex. How do we figure out how to divest? Some of the 350.org, you know, they looked at this oil and the fossil fuel sectors, and they said, how do we divest from this system as a society? And they started small, one school, you know, Unitarian Church jumped on, and now it's a movement. And I think you know, the same has to be looked at. You know, the military and industrial complex is so rooted in every part of our society. You know, we can't even boycott the thing. You know, I mean, my computer, everything has parts of it. Every school has, you know, is funded by it. It is literally, as Eisenhower pointed out, it spiritually affected our society. It is everywhere. And so how do we even just begin to divest? And I think that the question is like, how do we move our investment into communities to build up these projects that we need to survive? And so that, that's, and that's this, you know what, that was a major platform that just got put out by the movement for black lives. Investment and divestment. Divestment from the institutions that are killing black communities and investment into those communities, direct investment into those communities. And so like my question, I guess what I want to leave to everybody is, you know, what does it look like for us to begin to imagine a divestment campaign. Thank you, Aaron. You know, the, the entrenchment of the military industrial complex in terms of being dependent on corporate profits and government salaries is mirrored now also in the prison industrial complex. Yeah. Corporate profits, government salaries, and yet if we could imagine the possibilities of divestment, and one thing Aaron has taught me is that many of these different mega companies like Boeing, like Lockheed Martin, like um, British Aerospace, like North of Grumman, are not only involved in the military industrial complex, they're now becoming involved in the prison industrial complex as well, or they're involved in abuses of the environment. and so. Are there ways to link together efforts at divestment that also draw forth energies from the people who are carrying the brunt of the war in the United States because, in a sense, the war against the poor is continuing? Are there ways to then suggest reinvestment into the communities? And we, you know, we, we like to create what you can do sheets, and you know, we, we know that we have to do education, education, education. But might we begin to think about divestment and reinvestment? Um, 
we decided that for ecological reasons, and it's also easier on the pocketbook, we'd like to send you our handouts to your email address. So if you haven't signed this sheet here to give us your email address, please do. And if you look at your email address and say, well, no one can ever read that, then give us your phone number and we'll call you up and ask you for it. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that this, is there anybody who hasn't had a chance to sign this? Can we pass that back to Vicki? Thank you. Um, maybe a quote from young Guru Mai, who was pictured uh, in that video. He was interviewing Habib. And one time he was interviewing Noam Chomsky. <laughs> and we were pretty impressed that this teenager, 13 years old, was talking to Noam Chomsky. Oh, and he, he said, Prof Noam, what do you think about reparations? And Noam Chomsky said, oh, that's a very important question. And he then said, any civilized country would pay reparations to Afghanistan and Iraq for the, for the suffering caused. Now, it would take quite a big jump in our being involved in politics to ever <laughs> accomplish U.S. payment of reparations. But we still insist that the United States should entrust money to, to non-governmental organizations with a proven track record of staying outside of the terrible corrupt patterns in Afghanistan and Iraq. And you certainly mentioned one of them, Doctors Without Borders, and particularly this year with this very dramatic story of the bombing of the hospital in Kunduz and the bombings of hospitals in Syria. Um, I myself know that there are many questions about the United Nations, but I sure wouldn't want to say let's close down any one of the 38 UN agencies operating in Afghanistan. Are you going to close down the um, World Food Program? Are you going to close down the World Health Organization? Close down? the United Nations development programs. It's not perfect, but it's more reliable than, say, United States AID. Close that one down. Never give any money to USAID in Afghanistan. Corrupt to the max. Now, in terms of smaller organizations, we're like not even the mom and pop store on the continuum, you know. But voices, um, I can tell you, um, Every dime that's designated to a project in Afghanistan goes to that project. And um, we, we do sustain ourselves on the second floor of an apartment in Chicago. Yeah. Um, we're very happy to invite people to come, although right now I'm sleeping on the couch. We're, we're kind of full up. But, um, I appreciate we, that, Chicago. Uh, we do do our best to make sure that those projects are funded. And I guess I could give you a price tag for each project. The Duvet project costs $40,000. To um, pay a li living wage to each of 60 seamstresses and buy the materials and make the blankets. You know, I take that back. It's, the price went down to 30, uh, $38,000 last year. And the Street Kids project at $510 per child to give the rice and the oil to each of the children who then can sustain their families with that monthly ration. Um, just do the math, and that comes out to about $50,000. We also pay the rent for the Border Free Center. We pay for a live-in community um, of kids from the outlying provinces. And um, lately, they've done some wonderful work in planting saplings and organizing organic gardening. And so that, and then we also pay to send people like me and Sabia over. And if people go multiple times, we try to cover their expense. So, so it is a for, for us, it's a huge amount of money to come up with that budget, but it's funded entirely either by speaking stipends or um, generosity of people who get our newsletters, and sometimes the grant comes our way. I mean, um, I don't want to sound too negative, but what I want to say is you can't do both. You can't free up the resources in terms of money, ingenuity, skills, to enable sustainability and still satisfy the demonic suction cup of war making and defense expenditure in the United States. So what we say is take the money out of the war makers and the war profiteers coffers that are laughing all the way to the bank with US productivity. Um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was the one who called that a demonic suction cup and use that money to fight the very real terror that we all of us face globally the terror of what we're doing to our own environment. But you can't do both. So if people want to hear um, about the consequences of our wars, we'll come running. 
with or without a stipend, give us a sandwich. Don't even give us a sandwich. <laughs> We're with you. Um, I, I so, do think that there is, you know, this opportunity. There is a moment. There is a political moment that's emerging where people are seeing overlaps in ways that I don't think necessarily. I, I feel like a lot of the movements have been really segregated, and I really hope. Uh, you know, IBAW, someone we talked a lot about is how do we build a different kind of anti-war movement? How do we build a different kind of demilitarized movement? Because the movement we had in many ways, you know, that led up to 2008 that we were really part of, that many of us were very vocal in, in this room, not just IBAW, obviously. You know, really, like, that was feeding into the system we had. And I think the question is, you know, how do we imagine something slightly different? It's working a little bit differently and working in different communities. And I think that's where you, you know, you got to look at Grace and Bob, you got to look at the Afghan peace volunteers, you got to look at how these things fit. And I think those conversations are just now starting to happen. And I know, you know, I know IBW hasn't been as present. And I know that that's a critique of IBAW, but you know, let me tell you that you know the people that you know IBAW has really been you know focused on trying to build those relationships with those communities because it's not easy. And it takes a lot of patience and also a lot of acknowledgement of our own privileges and powers. I mean, something I think as veterans we have to like grapple with. We have extreme privileges. Yes, we like are all dealing with our experiences of war, and not only us are dealing with it, but also our entire society is dealing with it. I think that first kind of came to head with me when I was organizing in Chicago, and this group stopped, Southside Together Organizing for Power. You know, they came to Iraq Veterans Against the War because Rahm Emanuel, you know, this very amazing <laughs> mayor of ours, <laughs> who seems to hate people. Um, <laughs> You know, he closed every single mental health clinic in the city of Chicago. Mental health clinics that kids depended on. You know, we talk about street violence. We have an epidemic in Chicago. We talk about trauma. Does their trauma not matter? And they came to us and they said, our trauma, no one cares about our trauma but they care about yours, so stand with us. And we're so you know, glad. I think that, 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 that's the beginning of something we really got to, like how do we stand with those communities? What does it actually mean to be in solidarity? And I think that's where those dialogues are going to come out. It's not going to, it's not going to happen quickly. You know, over the next year, how does everybody, how do we all start having those dialogues so we can get to a point where we can build something different? Sorry that I, well, just to say, we're so glad that the Vets for Peace will come to Chicago next yeah. summer. And maybe we can be thinking about that question between now and then. I did want to say, going back to Rich, and also John and I were having this conversation, You, these right places, you're in the right place. You know, yeah. your, your own communities like they are doing. You, you don't have to look big. These, these issues are heavy. And to say that you know you're not looking in the right places, I think that you need to give yourself more credit and to look local, to look right next to you, to stop and say how are you. Just those do a lot. So yes, you can look big. You can ask for MSF Medicine Sans Frontier. You can, but you are what you are doing. You're in the right place. So, don't stop. Dennis? Would you have Sherry tell people how they can have global days of listening and actually hear the Afghan voices on the 21st of every month? And so, I'm just going to turn it over to Sherry. I hear her voice online. We saw it in person today. But you have a chance to listen to these voices. And not just the Afghans, because uh, we've been involved in bringing other people that have experienced uh, 
thing. So Sherry, why don't you share a little bit about what happens? Yeah, we've only got a few minutes before we have to give up the workshop time. So I'll, I'll say it briefly and I'll put my contact information. On the 21st of every month, um, Dennis and myself and initiated by Kathy, Kathy invited me about five years ago to participate in these worldwide conversations that happen. I think we're over 30 countries now with, um, and we've made border free friends. These scarves represent the community that Kathy and all of us have been to and visited and Abdul High are all part of, of the border free community that is spoken to through Global Days of Listening. The sky above us is blue. The scarves are blue to represent the sky above us, which has no borders. And we are collectively trying to create a world that is free of all racism, sexism, classism, etc., violence. And so we get on these calls on the 21st of every month, talking to people in countries across the world. We often have Iraq, Pakistan, always Afghanistan, because they're hosted by the Afghan peace volunteers and their, and their international partners who do the logistics. And our friend Dennis here is one of the, the key technology people of that conversation. We talk about permaculture, nonviolence, building community, education, all these issues that they've been talking about today. People share their hopes, their dreams, and what they're doing. Um, towards those goals together. And I've made friends that I talk to virtually every single day through Global Days, and I've begun to visit yeah. these other countries to visit um, some of the friends that we've made. Dennis and I have talked so many times, and we just met each other today, but we've been border-free <laughs> friends for a very long time. So I invite you to go to globaldayslisting.com. There is a link to the schedule. If you have a group and want to be part of the conversation, then there's a link to tell you how to be part of that schedule, or you can just listen. Sometimes if I'm going to school and I'm not able to be on the call, I listen because we have, we have a live stream connection that you can listen as you go about your day and hear the conversations from all over the world and see what we're about and begin to participate. Thank you all for coming. I just want to say, you know, I'd love it if people want to take these. Um, you know, if you don't have any, you know, please just take them. Uh, but if you can make a donation to Voices, so for the Kabul uh, Street Kids or for the Afghan Peace Volunteers, that's really, that mean a lot to me. Uh, that's why I made them. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, speaking of drones, there's this, uh, another print, Take Down the Drones here, which, <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Soldiers speak out.